Good morning. Welcome, everybody. This is very exciting. Uh, this is our first online seminar for teachers of A-level politics and advanced higher modern studies. And we're delighted we've got, uh, we could have up to 500 people in the room today. And uh, we're especially delighted that we've got teachers from all four nations and a few nations even beyond. So a warm welcome to all of you. Um, my name's David Carr. I work as part of the education engagement team at the UK Parliament. Um, and alongside my colleagues, Rosie Gillam and Tom Mitchell, who are also in the room today, uh, we work with teachers of all phases from early years and reception right through to primary, secondary, to post-16, which of course this event is, is for today. Uh, we do a lot of initial teacher training with universities and, and school college-based teacher training organisations. So if you have any contacts with any PGCE or PGDE programme leaders, we'd love to hear from you. Um, we're especially delighted today to be co-hosting with our partners, the Political Studies Association. By my reckoning, this is the seventh such event. Uh, the first one <coughs> was in 2016. Uh, with the topic, what makes a good prime minister? Um, and 10 days after we ran that session, there, there was, a, as you know, the leadership um, election for the um, leadership of the Conservative Party. But this is the very, very first online seminar. And uh, we're thrilled that so many of you be, have been able to uh, join us. So we're up to 242 right now. Uh, we're going to give it a, another few minutes. Uh, just a reminder to mute your mics if you're not speaking. Um, and you may want to um, stop your video on, unless you're speaking, but it's entirely up to you. Um, normally, of course, when we've held these at UK Parliament, we've, um, they've been full day events uh, and you'd even get a free lunch. Uh, no such luck today, I'm afraid. Uh, but of course, what we lack in, in, in the dietary sense, we hope we'll make, make up for with some stimulating discussion and even some nourishing debate during the Q&A. So it's slowly going up. So I think um, to tell you more about the first of our esteemed guests, uh, I'm now going to hand over to Dr. Rose Gann, who's Head of Politics and International Relations at Nottingham Trent University, and is also the elected trustee of the Political Studies Association. So over to you, Rose. Thank you, David. And um, a very, very warm welcome to all of you joining us this morning. Um, it is quite amazing to see the numbers going up. It's lovely to see so many teachers here and uh, a big hello to all teachers and colleagues who are joining us. Before we begin with our first talk, I'd like to say a little bit about the Political Studies Association, um, just to brief you on what we do and um, what our key aims are. The Political Studies Association is a registered charity set up with the aim of promoting the development of polit political studies and encouraging education and learning in government and politics. So as an association, we seek to support all sorts of different groups of people and individuals involved in teaching and studying politics across the whole of the UK. We support academics, we support researchers, we support students, and of course, we like to support teachers of politics and advanced modern studies in secondary schools and in sixth forms. So teachers are one of our key constituencies for us as an association. Often you provide us with the first opportunity for young people to study politics. So you have a critical role to play in developing the enthusiasm for the subject and passing on that, that interest and enthusiasm for what is a fascinating area of study. We've been co-hosting co these seminars with the Parliamentary Education Service for some years now, as David has just said. Um, this is one of many different events and activities that we put on for teachers. So if you're interested in finding out more about the Political Studies Association 
or if you'd like to find out more about what our teachers members package involves because we offer a specific membership for teachers then um, please look at your chat box and I think fairly shortly one of my colleagues from the PSA will put up the details about our membership and um, what sort of is you can be involved in if you want to sign up and join. So that's a little bit about us as the Political Studies Association. Clearly we're here today to look at a fascinating topic, um, to look at um, our seminar on parliamentary scrutiny, challenges and choices. Over the last 12 months, we've seen Parliament prorogued. Um, we've also more recently seen Parliament working in a very different way due to the coronavirus measures. And surely then it's a really timely topic to explore the ways in which Parliament is able to continue one of its most important roles, which is to examine and to investigate and at times challenge government policies and action. So to scrutinise government is, is, is clearly um, the, one of the prime roles for our Parliament. So I'm absolutely delighted to be able to introduce you to our first speaker today, Dr. Mark Bannister. Mark is a senior lecturer in politics at the University of Lincoln. His research focuses on political leadership, prime ministerial power, as well as governance and the role of committees in the UK Parliament. He leads on the Lincoln Centre for Parliamentary Research and he's published on accountability in Parliament, as well as political leadership and comparative prime ministerial power and oratory. So I'm very delighted today to be able to introduce Mark to you. His talk is on how does UK Parliament hold government to account? Thank you, Mark. I'll now hand over to you. That's great. Thank you very much indeed, Rose. I hope everyone can hear me uh, OK. So it's great to be here. I've got that little number going up, 264 participants. So it's great to see uh, so many uh, teachers um, uh, here and joining us. Uh, this morning. Um, so I'm going to uh, have a go at uh, just sharing my uh, screen. Uh, so hopefully everybody can see uh, can see this. I'm going to have a, a, a short presentation, some slides that will be available uh, to everybody um, as we go along, but also they'll be available uh, afterwards uh, as well. So um, Okay, so as Rose said, this is an extremely important topic we're, we're talking about. It's very, it's very topical in terms of relating to uh, current issues. We've had um, debates about what, uh, about, about Parliament in terms of uh, last year uh, with uh, Brexit, who controls Parliament, but also at the moment, uh, questions around scrutinising government policy uh, in the current pandemic. Uh, we've had a, a, a hybrid or, or semi-virtual um, parliament uh, and uh, now we've had a return with social distancing as well and a very different uh, looking parliament all uh, raising questions about uh, accountability. Um, I think we need to think about uh, uh, this question of how parliament uh, holds the government to, to account as being one of a fundamental democratic aspect, uh, holding uh, the government of the day to account irrespective of the size of the majority uh, of that uh, that government this is fundamental to uh, our democratic uh, functioning um, so we're going to think about how well parliament perhaps uh, performs uh, this uh, this function um, but before i go on to that i just um like to uh tell you a little bit more about myself and where i come from and sort of uh um, uh, what I've been involved in. I think um, Rose hinted at, at some of this. So I'm, I'm a lecturer in politics at, uh, uh, at uh, Lincoln. I was previously at Canterbury uh, Christchurch University. I've established the Lincoln Centre for Parliamentary uh, Research recently, uh, but also uh, I was an academic fellow in Parliament for three years. So I spent three years researching uh, in Parliament uh, being sort of uh, allowed to wander around with a pass to uh, work with committees uh, and to um, work with the, the speaker for a while uh, as well. So I could see and understand Parliament a little bit more uh, from uh, the inside. Uh, and you can see there's a, uh, there's a picture of me in action. Uh, they're giving, uh, giving evidence to a uh, select committee, which was the uh, political and constitutional reform committee, which is no longer in existence. But uh, there I was giving uh, evidence on the on the powers of the 
of the Prime Minister. Um, uh, at that time, investigation into uh, Prime Ministerial uh, Power, um, a committee led by uh, Graham Allen. Um, and there, and uh, the other picture you see on your screen uh, is the Liaison Committee, which I'll come on to uh, a little bit later in a bit more detail. So this there's Prime Minister uh, Theresa May giving evidence to the Liaison Committee. And if you look very carefully, just underneath that, uh, uh, the pause symbol, uh, you'll see me uh, sitting there on the clerk's table. Uh, so I had uh, access to the Liaison Committee and I was able to observe these, uh, these sessions. So I moved some thinking about Prime Ministerial leadership and Prime Ministerial power, uh, which I've written on to thinking about how does Parliament scrutinise uh, the Prime Minister in these uh, liaison committee sessions. And I was lucky enough uh, to sit up on uh, with the with the clerks, with the parliamentary staff, and observe those uh, those sessions from uh, uh, from a very privileged uh, position, uh, being in the room when the Prime Minister uh, is being held accountable uh, by uh, by uh, MPs. Okay, so that's a little bit about me, so you can get a bit of an understanding perhaps about um, sort of where, where I'm coming from, and I'm quite happy to answer questions, uh, take questions on the chat as well, and afterwards about uh, some of my experiences uh, about being uh, in and around Parliament as, a, uh, as an academic. Um, so I've mentioned uh, accountability and uh, scrutiny, um, and I think it's important uh, before we go on to sort of uh, differentiate a little bit between accountability uh, and scrutiny. So we should think of accountability as very much uh, the formal relationship. So ministers may have a formal relationship with Parliament. Um, so that's on a, on a much more sort of uh, uh, um, uh, into a much more um, uh, structured uh, relationship. Scrutiny, however, is the tools or the activity in which we see uh, accountability happening. Um, so often the terms are used interchangeable, but uh, uh, we do sort of have a slightly different um, approach. We think of that accountability as being that formal relationship between parliament and government through ministers and a scrutiny uh, is the function. Because of course the press and others scrutinize, uh, but it's, it's to parliament that uh, uh, the ministers are formally uh, accountable and required to explain and be cross-examined. Uh, so a few questions to consider as we go along. I'm going to think about what accountability actually uh, might look like, um, who is accountable uh, as well, and who does uh, the scrutiny, who scrutinises. I'm going to think a bit about executive dominance because in the Westminster system, uh, the executive, the government tends to dominate parliament. So I'm going to think about well, why do we, why does that happen? And think about constraints on parliament, uh, on the executive uh, as well. And then go into looking at what tools uh, parliament uh, actually are used to uh, scrutinise and to uh, uh, force accountability. Uh, and then I, I'm going to, when talking about tools, I'm going to focus very much on the prime minister uh, and also those sessions uh, with liaison uh, committee. Um, okay, so um, first of all, what does accountability uh, actually uh, look like? Um, well, in terms of Parliament, I guess um, this uh, wonderful picture from uh, Boris Johnson's first appearance at Prime Minister's Questions uh, is the sort of uh, prism of accountability uh, um, that we uh, that we think of. You know, the most sort of uh, famous mechanism uh, um, uh, of, a, of accountability with a prime minister appearing in the House of Commons uh, to take questions uh, at the dispatch box um, for, for prime minister's questions for half an hour or sometimes up to an hour. Uh, they're challenged by the opposition uh, in, a, in a full uh, full house. We might also think about it uh, as, uh, as this, as, as uh, MPs uh, challenging what turned uh, what turned about to be the uh, unlawful uh, prorogation uh, of Parliament, um, and that was all over who controls the agenda. Uh, is it Parliament that controls itself or the executive? And so uh, we might think of this as well as a form uh, of accountability uh, in terms of uh, Parliament um, 
uh, pushing its, its will, if you like, uh, on, on the executive, which was then upheld, as we know, in the Supreme Court. We might also think that accountability could uh, look like this. So this is, uh, this is a session of the uh, Foreign Affairs Select Committee, uh, that uh, uh, the sort of work that goes on in Parliament uh, is, that is in public, but, um, there is, uh, but may get less media attention. Uh, so forensic uh, type of uh, questioning and cross-examination. Um, so there are different, uh, different scrutinization uh, aspects to Parliament. Uh, accountability may take uh, many uh, different uh, forms. Um, so who does this, uh, who is actually formally accountable and who uh, does uh, the uh, uh, scrutinizing? Um, so uh, ministers are formally accountable uh, to parliament. Uh, so ministers may, uh, may uh, uh, will, will, will uh, be responsible for their, for their department, for what goes on in their department and their policy will are required to uh, explain uh, and answer questions on the floor of the house in regular uh, question time uh, where they are um, uh, challenged and scrutinized by the opposition parties. Um, uh, they will uh, as well um, uh, appear in front of select committees, are required to appear in front of com uh, select committees. So not only do opposition parties uh, challenge and cross-examine on the floor of the house, uh, then select committees uh, also uh, will be um, scrutinizing and asking uh, ministers to uh, explain the actions of their departments, but also uh, their own, um, excuse me, their own uh, personal actions. So we have at the moment um, uh, the interesting example whereby uh, Jeremy Hunt, former, um, uh, former health secretary, uh, former foreign secretary, but and also um, and also challenger for uh, leader of the Conservative Party, uh, is now chair of the Health and Social Care Select Committee uh, and uh, is holding to account in that position uh, the current Health Secretary, uh, Matt Hancock. So you've got uh, this dynamic that is not just about opposition challenging government, uh, but also in Select Committee, uh, the work of ministers being scrutinised uh, by um, uh, by potentially uh, uh, former colleagues uh, as well. So, um, so ministers are accountable uh, and a range of people uh, then provide the, uh, the scrutiny. Um, now I refer to uh, government uh, dominating uh, business, dominating the uh, dominating parliament and being able to um, um, uh, uh, put its, get its uh, program through um, um, as being a very um, important to a uh, way of thinking about our Westminster system. And so I wanted to look at this in a little bit more uh, detail. So uh, where does this come from? Well, one of the most famous standing orders in Parliament is Standing Order 14, uh, which says, save as provided in this order, government business shall have precedence at every sitting. Um, and this is this uh, this standing order is referred referred to a lot. So it is essentially prioritising government business, um, which gives you an idea that the sort of governments are elected, they get a majority, and then according to the standing the standing order, they have precedence for getting their business uh, through. Um, so they control the government controls the agenda on the floor of the house. Uh, except, and there are exceptions, so the opposition get 20 days uh, in a parliamentary setting, 17 for the formal um, opposition, three for the second uh, largest opposition party, uh, and those 20 opposition days, they can choose whatever topic they want uh, to debate on those opposition days. There are 13 Fridays for private members' bills, so bills that are not government, that have come from, uh, come from backbenchers, um, and 35 days uh, for backbench uh, business. Uh, so backbenchers can put business uh, forward uh, that is debated uh, in the House. Um, so those are the bits where the government doesn't really uh, have control uh, over what's, uh, 
uh, what's uh, debated, but government actually decides many other things. So it may decide on recess dates, uh, so the length of parliamentary session as well. So we've had uh, the, one of the longest parliamentary sessions then followed by one of the shortest. Um, government also de um, decides on the timing of all government bills and general debates. Also, the government decides uh, whether time is available to debate select committee uh, reports. Those 20 opposition day debates that I mentioned uh, earlier, um, well, the government decides when those are going to occur. Um, governments also can make statements to the House at any time uh, too. So they can decide, right, we're making a statement today on the issue uh, of the day. Um, and every Thursday, it's it's changed under the current circumstances uh, when business uh, statement may be. Um, but traditionally, it's always on being always on a Thursday. A business statement will be made to the House. There's no vote, no opportunity to amend this. The government will set out uh, its business. So governments do dominate business and control uh, time, uh, <clears throat> particularly managing uh, business on the floor of the House. Um, and this um, demonstrates, this is um, data from the Institute for Government, so uh, covering a period of about a year from June 2017 to June uh, 2018, you see that grey square uh, of 470 hours of government time there, dominates time on the floor of the House. Uh, other things, oral questions that are put, uh, urgent questions, ministerial statements and so on, uh, make up the rest of the time. Uh, so. Government controls time on the floor of the House, and that's one of the mechanisms that it has. And opposition parties and others uh, have to try and hold the government accountable um, through other mechanisms. And there are constraints. And there are constraints on the floor of the House of Commons uh, as well. Um, so here's a couple of uh, important examples here uh, where um, opposition parties on the floor of the House of Commons uh, have managed to uh, scrutinise and hold government to account, um, so using a couple of tools uh, to great effect, uh, particularly uh, last year during, uh, during all the toing and froing uh, over Brexit. Um, so uh, the, first, um, uh, the first graph, again, this is Institute for Government uh, Data, uh, so the number of urgent questions per sitting day. Uh, that it would ask the data runs from 2007 uh, 8 session up to the uh, 2019 uh, sessions. And the different colour you'll see uh, in the, um, at the top of the sessions um, uh, that uh, orange colour is, is those, um, uh, those urgent questions relating uh, to Brexit uh, issues. But what we can see is there's been a, a, a substantial rise in urgent questions. So urgent questions uh, are questions that may be put in by the opposition or an MP uh, that is accepted by the Speaker for debate and means a minister has to come to uh, the House to answer questions and have a short debate. So it's a means of forcing the government to explain its actions force it to be accountable to the House. Um, and um, uh, this very much, did, this, this wasn't a structural change, but more of a behavioural change, whereby uh, the Speaker of the House, um, John Burko, accepted more and more urgent questions, and we see that rise. Uh, ministers were never particularly happy about having to come uh, to the House and answer questions. Uh, and this, uh, this, this um, behavioural change seems to have carried on uh, under Speaker uh, Lindsay Hoyle. Uh, so this is an important um, um, scrutiny tool that uh, MPs have used. Um, then the other, uh, the other chart shows us the number of emergency debates that have dramatically increased as well. So in a similar way, uh, MPs can use standing orders uh, to force an emergency debate. Uh, slightly different from answering an urgent question, but it forces a debate on a topical issue. And um, we've seen that Brexit was very much uh, the driver there. Um, so this gives you an idea about uh, some of the constraints on the executive that can still be uh, exercised. 
Um, there are, of course, many others in terms of rebellions or threats of rebellion uh, from uh, um, from MPs uh, on the government's own side that can uh, that can act uh, as a constraint, uh, and also the House of Lords. Uh, isn't it? It's important to mention the House of Lords that could also act as a constraint uh, on the uh, on the executive. And perhaps later on, you may, may hear a little bit more about uh, questions and and challenges in the House of Lords. So moving away from the floor uh, of the uh, of the House of Commons, what happens in the chamber uh, to uh, select committees, which I've mentioned uh, several times. Now we've just been sort of uh, um, recently last year celebrating uh, the 40 years of uh, select committees, um, and this has been a great success for Parliament um, that you have a, a strong committee system, um, select committees that uh, look at uh, departments look at ministers' role uh, and less uh, at legislation. Public bill committees look at uh, legislation, where select committees uh, can uh, instigate their own uh, inquiries. They are much more uh, autonomous. Um, chairs are now uh, elected by the whole of the House, and uh, so they have a mandate uh, from the House. Um, so they are they have their own sort of career route. They are less partisan as well. So they will select committees, will contain uh, members uh, across the political divide. But they are much more consensual. So uh, they try to leave that sort of party politics uh, at the door of the committee. They produce uh, reports and recommendations. They are an important uh, accountability uh, mechanism and they conduct their scrutiny uh, in public. Um, they may collect evidence from the public uh, and they have been uh, much more um, active in engaging the public uh, in giving evidence. So organisations, but also members of the public may give evidence, but also committees like the Health and Social Care Committee have been involved in, um, involved in activities such as citizens uh, assemblies to, uh, to gather uh, evidence from, uh, from the general uh, public. Um, we've also had things like the Banking Commission in 2012 uh, as well, which, uh, which had a wider public accountability role, not just about holding ministers to account, uh, but also uh, doing uh, accountability work and scrutinising from outside, um, looking, at, uh, looking at outside uh, government. Um, we've also had inquiries such as those into um, the collapse of uh, BHS, and we're getting uh, more, uh, there were many inquiries in, in, uh, on, on aspects of Brexit, and we're now uh, getting a range of inquiries looking at the current uh, pandemic and the government's uh, response to it as well. Um, so select committees uh, have been a really important uh, part uh, of, the, of the architecture um, at the, in the House of Commons, um, in particular in terms of being able to force ministers to explain uh, their action and explain uh, policy. Um, ministers appear regularly before select committees, um, but what about prime ministers, which has one, been one of the focuses of, uh, of my, uh, my own research? Um, who actually holds the prime minister uh, to account? Um, and, um, and does the prime minister uh, always manage to uh, dominate parliament, particularly uh, when they have uh, a majority, uh, where they are, uh, the, the government holds a majority? Um, so there are cases where MPs on the floor of the house uh, can hold the prime minister uh, to, uh, to account. The prime ministers uh, do not always uh, get their way. Um, so a couple of examples here. Um, so going back to August 2013, uh, when David Cameron um, lost a vote, even though he was holding a majority in the House against military action uh, in Syria, uh, when 30 Conservatives joined with the opposition um, to, uh, to vote down prime, um, military action. Um, so uh, more recently, uh, we've had uh, in, in 2019 prime ministers losing successive votes on the floor of the house. And so uh, um, Boris Johnson, uh, prior to the uh, December election, lost multiple votes, uh, but so did uh, Theresa May before him 
Um, so pressure from backbenchers, pressure from the numbers, prime ministers can lose votes or and do not always dominate uh, in the House. And this sometimes can happen even uh, with a majority. They have to maintain the consent uh, of the House of Commons. Um, but of, all, of course, the most the sort of well-known is Prime Minister's questions I mentioned uh, uh, mentioned earlier. So um, they're where Prime Ministers are held to uh, account or appear to be held to account. Um, so first of all, how does Prime Minister's uh, uh, questions uh, actually work? Um, um, well, it's actually in parliamentary terms, Prime Minister's questions is a fairly uh, new mechanism. So it's only from 1961 um, that we first saw Prime Minister's questions. Later, uh, it was televised as well, which really raised the profile. Uh, Tony Blair in uh, uh, 1997 uh, shifted from twice a week uh, to once a week. Um, so it was, uh, uh, he didn't want to prepare for Prime Minister's questions twice a week. It's much easier as Prime Minister to prepare for an appearance once a week, uh, even if appearing for the same time. So uh, technically this is called questions to the Prime Minister, where the Prime Minister lists their uh, engagement. It appear, at the moment it's 12 o'clock, as we know, every Wednesday. Um, last for 30 minutes but maybe longer. The former speaker John Burko let the sessions go on uh, for a considerable amount of time, sometimes up to an hour, calling all MPs who were listed. Uh, MPs are chosen by something called the shuffle the Thursday before 15 MPs are randomly chosen. Um, there are often bobbing MPs that get picked by the speaker. They may have indicated to the speaker uh, that they have a particular reason to come in and the speaker may call them. Um, questions are, uh, tend to be asked in order um, and the leader of the opposition gets six goes. The next opposition party gets uh, two goes. Um, so there is a sort of formulaic uh, nature uh, to the way uh, that it works uh, every uh, every week. Um, is it accountability? Um, well, uh, the Prime Minister may get very supportive questions from uh, government backbenchers uh, and it's a chance for the opposition uh, to attack or hold or try to hold the Prime Minister for, uh, to account to answer questions. Um, questions tend to be often about constituencies. Is it accountabil accountability if only 427 of, uh, uh, of uh, MPs out of 650 can actually sit in the chamber at the moment, of course, with social distancing, uh, there's, uh, uh, there's a limit to how many MPs can be in the chamber. But it is still the main event, uh, the Prime Minister versus uh, the leader of the opposition. It's accountability in the sense that the Prime Minister has to prepare. He needs to be briefed across uh, all departments, needs to anticipate what questions the opposition is likely to ask. So behind the scenes, uh, there is a sense of accountability going on because policy needs to be explained. And we've seen the exchanges recently between uh, Keir Starmer and Boris Johnson have been very much relating to policy um, without some of the political theatre um, that we'd, uh, we're used to with Prime Minister questions, Prime Minister of questions. Um, so does it matter at all, Prime Minister's questions? I think it's a regular pressure point for Prime Minister, uh, um, for the Prime Minister and the potential replacement. So uh, it is an intense political high point of the, re of, of the week. Uh, it can release the sort of the political tension, the valve, uh, of politics, you get clips in TV as well. And it is a chance for MPs to question uh, the Prime Minister in the chamber. And we've seen some uh, policy shifts uh, uh, in rec with recent Prime Ministerial questions. So there is a sense that this, is, that this matters and it's an explanation of policy um, as well, even though uh, it is very much a theoretical uh, exchange. Um, Prime Ministers themselves are, uh, are, are never too keen on it. David Cameron uh, was uh, 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 pledged to change uh, the, way, the way we behave at Prime Minister's questions. It was punch and duty politics, Westminster name calling and backbiting. So he was, uh, uh, he, he, 
uh, but then when he uh, when he was there at the dispatch box, uh, he was uh, 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 seemingly quite keen to carry on uh, with with the theatre. Uh, Tony Blair as well uh, was uh, said in his autobiography uh, uh, how difficult he felt uh, Prime Minister's questions was. And one of the interesting things is that uh, uh, if when we go back to a full chamber at Prime Minister's questions, will we see a return to that political theatre? Or will we still have that forensic questioning and uh, that that, uh, uh, that 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 change of uh, exchange that we've had uh, more uh, recently? Um, okay, moving on from Prime Minister's questions, I'd like to focus on um, on uh, something I've been involved in researching that I've referred to several times: the liaison committee. So, um, the liaison committee is like a super committee um, um, of select committee chairs. Uh, and there are um, 37 select committee chairs who all sit on the liaison committee. And since 2002, uh, this committee uh, has uh, questioned the Prime Minister. Um, so uh, so um, Tony Blair was the first to appear before liaison committee. Um, and um, he agreed to uh, appear before the committee um, um, once, um, once a year uh, and uh, on the basis that he thought it would uh, it would meant that he could be more visible, uh, explain policy, uh, but also uh, would mean that he wouldn't have to appear before any other select committee. By convention, prime ministers do not have not uh, appeared in front of uh, select committees. You can, uh, you can, uh... So. Um, since then, we've had five prime ministers, 38 sessions. Um, so this is a new form of a reasonably new form of prime ministerial accountability. Um, but it's only two or three times a year. It is much more forensic. Uh, we now have only 14 MPs um, sitting around the table questioning the prime minister. And two weeks ago, we had uh, Boris Johnson giving his uh, first having his first appearance in front of the liaison committee. It was a, a, a hybrid or a virtual session. Um, uh, and there he was challenged on a lot of policy issues around the pandemic. So, uh, and this caught quite a lot of media uh, attention. It is much less partisan. And each of these, uh, each of the MPs uh, um, questioning the prime minister, they'll have a particular uh, area of expertise based on their committee work. So it could be health and social care, or it could be foreign affairs or wherever they happen to be, uh, uh, whichever committee they, they are uh, there um, as chair of. So what can we learn from these sessions? Well, we can learn how well a prime minister actually knows their own brief, how well they know the policy. Um, so um, the prime minister was challenged on aspects of, of current uh, policy in the last in the last session. And in, um, um, we can kind of find out a little bit more about potential policy development. So uh, so we could uh, we could see some when likely um, uh, relaxation of the of the current uh, um, restrictions. Uh, in the pandemic uh, may happen and what the impact of those uh, may be. Um, but it also, really importantly, we can think about how decisions were made uh, in number 10 by questioning the Prime Minister uh, in this arena. And some of the best sessions have been about, well, who did you talk to, Prime Minister? Who advised you on this particular policy? Um, is it effective? Uh, well, some sessions have worked better than others. I think timing is very important. So the last session coming just after the Dominic Cummings affair uh, was quite a lively session, albeit as a virtual session. Um, uh, and other, other sessions have worked less well, but often it depends on timing. And bear in mind that these sessions are only uh, two or three times a year. Um, then you know they're not frequent enough uh, to to uh, to really uh, to 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 really hit that that the timing that would uh, uh, that would put a, a prime minister constantly on the spot. And it was interesting at the end of the last session that the prime minister made no commitment uh, to appear again uh, uh, soon. Um, but uh, these evidence sessions that the Prime Minister has with the Liaison Committee is something that's not really uh, comparable uh, with other countries. This, this, this formalised questioning of a Prime Minister 
um, uh, by a group of senior MPs. So in Scotland, there is the conveners group, uh, for instance, that meets now two times a year, questions the first minister, but that's more broadly on the legislative uh, programme rather than concentrating on a single theme. And these have only happened since 2013. Uh, in Scotland. So it's important to think of liaison committee sessions with the Prime Minister um, as a, a form of uh, forcing the Prime Minister to be, uh, to be accountable. Um, so I'm happy to take further questions and uh, on, on how the liaison committee uh, operates, but maybe just to summarise uh, a few things uh, and to, to bring that, my, uh, the session to a close before we uh, move on to the, to the next one. The, um, the executive still holds sway um, and still dominates. It dominates policy making, it controls the agenda, so it controls the legislative agenda, but also controls, very importantly, time, especially on the floor of the House. Um, Parliament can be assertive, um, but largely this is a sort of delaying or think again type action. So it can say, okay, maybe your government you want to think again about this um, it has limited or it doesn't really have any sanctions on ministers it cannot force a minister to resign um, but it can put pressure on a minister so opposition parties and sometimes backbenchers can put pressure on um, so it asks for explanations uh, and cross-examination uh, can add to pressure um, in terms of the prime minister um, Prime Minister doesn't always dominate. It may, the Prime Minister may appear to be in a dominant position, being the head of the largest party with a majority, uh, but, but there are cases either the Prime Minister may not always dominate. Cabinet colleagues may disagree. Uh, Parliament may be able to uh, assert itself and put a Prime Minister uh, on the spot. The Prime Minister is scrutinised by Parliament, Prime Minister's questions, statements to the House, although we've only had one Prime Ministerial statement to the House uh, on the current pandemic, uh, it's worth noting, um, but also liaison committee appearances. <clears throat> but sometimes this is not always effective scrutiny. The Parliament has successes with the select committee, uh, select committee scrutiny, but sometimes this isn't always effective um, scrutiny. So we've seen stronger select committees, liaison committee, growth of uh, urgent questions, um, but the government still control the time and control the uh, control agenda. Um, so it's a delicate balancing act. Um, so on my last slide, I've just uh, uh, had a list of reading for those who are interested. Some of these are academic articles and others, and I'll, I'm happy to circulate a list of other resources to do with Prime Minister uh, and uh, other areas. So um, thank you very much for uh, listening, and uh, I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, Mark. That was uh, very informative. Really, really appreciated that. I think we've got just a couple of minutes to perhaps ask one or two questions of Mark before our next speaker. Thank you hugely, everybody who has been feeding us with lots and lots of questions, Mark. They've been pinging in as you've been speaking. Um, I'm just going to pick out one, if I may, and we will try and get back and answer all of these in the fullness of time um, when we move offline to look at them. But um, questions just, just follow on Mark around um, Prime Minister questions really. Um, a couple of sort of questions coming through about is that really fit for purpose now as a means of scrutinising the Prime Minister? Um, it tends to be a very sort of theoretical event and, and, and does it actually um, do the job of scrutinising the Prime Minister? And, and added to that another question that's come in is, is, is this question of whether actually Prime Minister questions have been more effective since um, the chamber has been reduced and smaller to sort of reduce that sense of theatre and, 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 and show, if you like. So maybe you could just give us your thoughts on that question. Mm -hmm. um, great. Thank you very much, Rose. There's kind of uh, two parts that I think that the um, Prime Minister's questions have had, uh, has had uh, a lot of uh, criticism from academics like uh, myself and others, but also from those uh, in Parliament uh, as well, saying that, well, 
you know it is has become more theatrical more partisan uh, as well um, that the prime minister often doesn't answer questions um, so uh, i think these are valid criticisms uh, of uh, prime minister's questions but i think bearing in mind um, that prime ministers so uh, from um, tony blair onwards would attend 90 95 percent of prime minister's questions the fact that this this mechanism happens every week and the prime minister does attend unless they have official engagements or uh, any other legitimate reasons prime minister do tend to appear it forces the prime minister uh, into the chamber uh, every week and that's an important uh, um, scrutiny mechanism uh, i think the second question is a really interesting question about thinking uh, is this a, a better form of scrutiny that we have now uh, without the the noise in the chamber um, um, without the uh, without a crowded chamber uh, there either behind the leader of the opposition or behind the, the prime minister uh, so we get a better understanding of the of the brief and one of my colleagues pointed out to me uh, that usually you have the prime minister's um, um, private secretary parliamentary private secretary sitting behind um, uh, passing some notes occasionally prime minister is there a little bit more exposed now and has to think on their feet a little bit more so i think we're seeing a better quality of scrutiny that's going on at the moment um, whether we return to the old style prime minister of questions we'll we'll have to see but i think at the moment we are seeing a better form of scrutiny that is much more forensic uh, that is asking questions that the, that the public would like to know um, um, from the opposition and the prime ministers um, um, is being forced to answer those questions. Thank you very much, Mark. I think we've now reached the point where we need to move to our second speaker. So I will hand back over to David. Thank you, Rose, and thank you again, Mark. Um, I'd just like to say a few words of welcome to the Right Honourable, the Baroness Morgan of Coates in the county of Leicestershire, to give her a full title. Uh, Nikki Morgan was first elected as MP for the marginal seat of Loughborough in 2010. Uh, following stints in the Treasury, she was appointed Secretary of State for Education and Minister for, for Women and Equalities in 2014. When Theresa May became Prime Minister in 2016, Nikki returned to the backbenches and was elected by her fellow MPs to be Chair of the Treasury Select Committee for two years from 2017 to 2019. And then she returned to the Cabinet uh, in Boris Johnson's administration as Digital, Culture, Media and Sports Secretary of State. So, Uniquely, I think, Nikki has therefore experienced parliamentary scrutiny from both sides of the table in both the House of Commons and more recently, of course, in the House of Lords. And I'd just like to say she's been a huge supporter of the education and engagement team at Parliament throughout her time as a member. And I'm delighted she's kindly agreed to join us today. So over to you, Nikki. Well, thank you very much indeed, David. Uh, thank you to everybody. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, and I'm delighted that the education engagement team um, is doing online virtual uh, events because I think it is so important in terms of explaining how Parliament works. And um, uh, it is extraordinary to see that wonderful new education centre that some of you might have visited uh, lying empty. Uh, at the moment and hopefully it will be full again of um, excited uh, pupils and, and teachers and staff um, at some point in the uh, in the future. Um, as David said, I wanted to give you perhaps just a, a, a flavour and I came in just at the end of, of Mark's question or Mark's presentation and heard the questions uh, of what it's like to face questions. Um, uh, as David said, I've done it in both Houses of Parliament, which I suspect is probably quite uh, unique. Um, and in fact, um, it was only in the last few years that the standing orders of the House of Lords were changed so that there was specific ministerial questions if there was a Secretary of State sitting in the House of Lords. There have been a few, uh, but obviously uh, not, uh, not many. Um, and uh, I have done questions obviously as a backbench member of Parliament, as a junior minister, as a Secretary of State, um, and also as a Select Committee uh, Chair. Um, I've participated most recently in virtual proceedings in the House of Lords, um, watched what's going on in the House of Commons. Um, and I think that questions are a really important part of the scrutiny role 
of uh, members of parliament of ministers um, and although there may be many criticisms of virtual proceedings and things that don't quite work well at the end of the day the ability for backbench uh, MPs and, and peers to ask questions of ministers for ministers to have to stand there and answer but also for their officials to have to draft the answers um, is still a very important ask of government uh, and I'm glad that it is uh, very much uh, continuing. Um, uh, in terms of questions, I mean, um, the honest truth is who, who gets most out of, of questions? And I think the, the reality is um, what you want as a minister is for your question time to be as unnewsworthy as possible, unless there is a specific announcement that you are looking to, uh, to get out. Um, and obviously for the Member of Parliament, uh, our concert on the Commons, uh, to, uh, you know, for them, asking the question, obviously, um, whether it can be very much constituency based or perhaps national, um, in a way, I think the questioner gets more out of it. Um, and particularly if it's, it's constituency based, it's often a really, really good example or, or way for an MP to raise a local matter on a national stage. Um, and you can often spot uh, we would often joke the press release question uh, where somebody has been um, uh, mentioned. So my first question to uh, Prime Minister David Cameron when I was first elected was about uh, Loughborough University uh, and the student union and how much they had raised um, in their RAG uh, events that year, over a million uh, pounds. Um, and the first virtual question asked by a backbench member of parliament recently was by Luke Evans who is the Member of Parliament for Bosworth, who asked a question about the reopening of zoos because he has Twycross Zoo in his constituency. Um, and that's a really effective way of highlighting a local issue, putting pressure on uh, the minister. Um, and uh, he's done that, you know, a number of different ways and got to the stage where actually the announcement's been made, obviously, about the reopening of zoos. My first uh, time, so um, uh, obviously um, as a whip, uh, which I was first of all, um, whips are assigned different government departments to look after um, and you are expected to be there to uh, monitor how your ministers in your department do in terms of questions. I heard Mark talking about the PPS, the, the Parliamentary Private Secretary. Part of their role in terms of questions, obviously, is when the list is published of who's asking a question, is to uh, contact the MPs, particularly on the government side, and to find out what the supplementary is going to be, whether there is a particular answer that is uh, needed. By and large, um, although you may know what the question is going to be, they're often very general, the first question, and then it's a supplementary in which there's a, a detail. And as you're either side of the house, government or opposition, if it's a local issue on which you need a specific answer from the minister, uh, then you probably would share what the question's going to be to make sure you get a helpful answer. And that would be the same with Prime Minister's questions. But obviously, if it's perhaps an issue where you don't want to alert the minister to what you're going to say, then you won't share that information. So ministers will not know usually uh, what the supplementary question is going to, to, to be. Um, uh, but you can often guess and, and you know, sometimes uh, you might see that there's a theme emerging in a particular question time. And actually questions are also a very important part of getting a sense of what MPs are most interested in. Or perhaps um, if it's pre a big event like a budget, you get a sense of what MPs and therefore constituents are looking for. So, for example, uh, when I was doing DCMS questions, obviously lots of questions about broadband and connectivity in constituencies. A real sense that actually that's an important issue. It's coming up on the doorsteps, coming up in surgeries and people are asking for more funding and investment. Uh, it might be the same about a particular um, rumour about a tax rise, for example, if you're in the Treasury, so things like fuel duty. And it's a very effective way of MPs starting and running and um, continuing campaigns on issues that they are particularly focused on. I've also asked questions, as I say, as a chair of a select committee. By convention, the speaker will always find a way to get the chair of the select committee into a question time, um, even if their name's not on the order paper. And as you probably know, what will happen is that the uh, speaker, obviously there'll be the, uh, the, the question asked by the MP, uh, they'll then ask a supplementary, um, and then the speaker, people will stand, and that's what virtual proceedings obviously have made impossible, which is why it's all much more scripted, but normally 
the MPs would stand and would uh, try to intervene on the back of. It's got to be related to the question, uh, but as you all uh, also know, MPs can be very inventive as to what is uh, related. Um, and, um, uh, you know, you can, you can find a way to bring in broadband connectivity in the northeast, even if the original question was about mobile phone connectivity in Wales, for example. Um, there's always a, um, a, uh, an opportunity to, to, to do that. Um, there is enormous timing pressure and I suspect that, I don't know if you've already asked it, but one of the questions obviously is, well, you know, why are the questions not answered? Well, sometimes, uh, frankly, um, the Minister, you don't have the, the information. Sometimes you don't want to particularly go into the, 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 the details. It may be something that's not been uh, worked out or policy that's still in uh, formation. Or equally, you know there's an announcement coming, but not quite ready to, to make it uh, yet. But of course, there are some questions where, you know, it's easy to ask a short, pithy question. Actually, the answer is pretty long and complicated. And frankly, there isn't the time. The speaker wants to get through in both houses. They want to get through as many questions as possible. Um, and so you'll often see there's a real time pressure from the speaker on the minister uh, to make sure uh, that they um, uh, get through as many questions as possible as those on the uh, order paper. It moves incredibly quickly. I remember my first questions that I did as a junior treasury minister, um, you know, I think anybody, however good you are at, uh, or accustomed you are at public speaking or anything like that, there's a real sick feeling in the pit of your stomach. It, you know, it's high profile, the sketch writers can be there, particularly if there's a controversial issue being faced by the department or a newsworthy secretary of, of state. Um, and it's a, it's a high profile platform in which to uh, make a wrong uh, step. But equally, it's one of those places where you hone uh, parliamentary uh, skills, both as a, as a backbencher in terms of asking questions, but also in terms of being a minister uh, and, um, and answering them. Um, it's, you know, it's high octane, it's high adrenaline, it's an hour, um, uh, usually probably, I mean, John Burko used to make sure it definitely was an hour. Lindsay Hoyle is, is uh, much more, I think, watching the, 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 the clock. Um, but, uh, you know, you want to make sure that you get in as much as, uh, as possible. Um, so I think, um, David, I'm going to leave it there. I hope that's given a sense of, of questions and very happy to answer, you know, um, your questions from, from all different perspectives. Thanks, Nikki. And I think uh, Rose is going to be uh, passing some questions to both. Yes, I, I, I am indeed back. Sorry, there was a short delay there for my technology to... <laughs> To arrive at the same time as me but I yes. think I've arrived now so thank you very much Baroness Morgan for, for, for that really interesting um, account of, of, of the way in which Parliament works. There have been questions flicking up now on my screen in various places and um, I guess um, I'm just trying to look through. Um, one, one question that's quite an interesting one from a sort of local practitioner sense that's come through is is how much advice and support do MPs actually get when they're thinking about raising a question and how do they start thinking of crafting that and who advises them on the best way of doing that question to Baroness Morgan well I think it's an overall it, it, the system of induction of being an MP has got better uh, but being, being working in Westminster as an MP is um, the strangest working environment I think anyone can ever be in um, not only complete lack of job security, um, there is no employment contract um, and there is no training. Um, so my, I've been involved in politics for 20 years as a volunteer before I was elected and I arrived on my first day in Parliament and I was given a laptop and a pass and told good luck, there you are. Um, and uh, in terms of, uh, there was some, some uh, induction by um, some of the whips, that's more in terms of you know, things this is how you do not appear on the front page of a newspaper anytime soon. Um, but there was a little bit of asking questions, but not much. It, it's trial and error, basically. Um, and it's watching experienced members of parliament, um, those who do it well and those who don't, uh, those who are able to ask um, pithy and effective questions. And there are some people that never quite get that skill. Um, and there are others who do it beautifully on all sides of the, of the house. Um, and uh, I think it's also about having a good issue to ask about. Now, there are two types of questions, I suppose. Um, there's the question that genuinely is, is sort of, I say, constituency based or, or it's, an, it's an issue 
a national issue about something that people really care about. And there are also the questions that the whips would like you to ask because that helps the minister to get out something useful or it takes up some time to avoid any more difficult questions. And I think we can all spot those questions from uh, a mile off. And I think for MPs, the challenge and the trick is to, if you're asked to, you know, if you think well, I'm going to be helpful and ask a question to help the minister, is still asking it in a way that means it is relevant to your constituency um, and uh, it doesn't just completely look like it has been written by, by somebody else. Some MPs will have researchers to help them, um, but I think ultimately, at the end of the day, it is up to the MPs because they are the ones asking it. And there's also a skill in terms of not reading. You're not meant to read things in the chamber. Obviously, when people are new, they will literally read every word. But over time, hopefully, people don't do that to make sure it's more interactive. Thank you. Um, very interesting um, answer there for us. Um, I have got another series of questions, which mm. I can probably ask both um, Baroness Morgan and, and Mark to answer if they like. And this is all around the role of select committees. And we've, we've heard a bit about them from, from both talks now. And I guess there's a, a whole group of questions that have come in. So I'm going to kind of gather them together. And those questions really are around their effectiveness, how effective from your different perspectives, looking at these areas of work of, of government are select committees. Um, how much do their recommendations actually get accepted? I mean, do they actually have any effective change to them how how does that work and and then there's a really interesting question that came through a while back around the use of social media to engage community so can the select committees or do they reach out more and should they be reaching out more because of course that important route in for the public to actually um, start setting some of that scrutiny or questioning of, of the role of government. Um, what is the way in there for the public so um, maybe I don't know who, who would like to, Baroness Morgan, would you like to, 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 to start off and then we'll hand over to Mark? And Yeah, sure. Um, I think select committees are, um, well, obviously they're, they're all different. And uh, some of them are, as you will know, more internally facing to the House of Commons. Some of them have got very particular. So the um, Security Intelligence Security Committee has got a very particular role. But speaking of my experience on the Treasury Select Committee, and I think select committees are a critical part of democracy in this country. Um, they're, they're most effective in a way when they're dealing with an immediate issue. So the current crisis being one whereby Jeremy Hunt is getting people and Greg Clark as well, Science Technology Committee, getting people in front of them. Uh, it could also be the, the Treasury Debt Committee, the Bank of England, for example, to ask them questions of things that are happening now and to get people's uh, perspectives. The, the, longer, the longer reports that, that happen, they are important and often their effectiveness, it depends on, again, um, uh, how the recommendations are, are drafted but actually things do get picked up and I was staggered once to listen to a party conference speech by Theresa May and to see how she picked up on something we'd recommended about um, a housing uh, um, account uh, run by local authorities um, and I hadn't even registered that it registered with, with government really so things do get picked up. One of the challenges for that committee is returning to their reports it's really easy and I tried when I was doing it to go back to things we had said uh, to make sure that they, because government will publish a response, frankly they don't have to accept things, they can, or, or they, you know, it can be very high level. So to keep going back, and of course it's not just about government, it's about other bodies um, uh, as, as well, for example. Finally, in terms of social media, we did try in, in the Select Committee, uh, Treasury Select Committee, to use social media more. We found it particularly effective on things like, for example, when we were doing the investigation into uh, TSB Bank and they had big IT problems and we had uh, evidence from the chief executive. We had customers literally messaging us, telling us what was going on. And we were able to, uh, we had somebody in the committee, a member of staff who was able to relay what they were picking up on Twitter and get it into our questions. Um, and also we have done that in terms of asking people to contribute evidence. I'm sure there's more that could be done. It tends to be very Twitter focused as opposed to other things. Uh, but I think it's, I think set committees are, are embracing that more and more. Thank you. Mark? Uh, yeah, thank you. Yeah, uh, and this is a really interesting point about how effective select committees may be. And I, and I agree there's two, there's, there's two ways of looking at this because I guess there is the, um, there are the evidence sessions. So we can think of high profile sessions and where ministers are uh, put on the spot by, um, by select committees that can be extremely timely uh, as well. So uh, to deal with an issue that, that may be in the news, that is in the, uh, that is in, is in the public interest. Um, but then there's the, there's the reports uh, and the recommendations and how much government uh, really takes on board some of those. So there has been quite a lot of work to say that government are 
generally very slow to respond to uh, to select committee uh, um, uh, reports. Uh, they are required to respond, but they they're often uh, often takes a long time to 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 report. And sometimes select committees themselves have moved on to uh, the next inquiry and so on, and uh, often are not so joined up in, in terms of following through. So it depends on what you, how you how you what you think is effective. The effectiveness may be simply bringing people in front of a committee, could be the Bank of England, it could be, uh, could be uh, uh, senior ministers, it could be uh, senior civil servants as well, uh, uh, sometimes to explain uh, a policy at, at the moment. So, um, so it is important to think about the different aspects of the work that select committees uh, do and the profile that they, that they have. Um, it's important to know that reports are, are very detailed uh, and uh, and can make a whole range of recommendations and can put ideas in the in the public domain, which is really important. That could be taken on by uh, by a range of different players as well. So they have that role uh, too. Uh, on public engagement, I think select committees have, have, have uh, are a lot better at this now. They are there's a whole agenda of public engagement, and so whether it's setting up uh, uh, citizen assemblies or whether it's uh, having uh, sessions from uh, taking sessions out of Westminster obviously we have we have virtual sessions now but there could be uh, traveling to uh, have uh, have sessions uh, uh, in different parts of the parts of the country and engaging in a different way with the public um, public encouraged to give evidence to so uh, for so finding different ways for the public to engage as a route into Parliament has been very much uh, uh, um, something that select committees have been focusing on recently. Thank you. Um, another question that's sort of come around in various forms as we've gone through both talks is all around the role of the speaker. Yes. And um, how effective is that role? Has that role become stronger, less strong? We've seen a lot of activity around sort of discussions around agenda setting, around who has time to put forward questions and how those are chosen in the House of Commons. So again, maybe we could um, turn to both our speakers and ask them to just share their views and thoughts on the, these, these areas for us. I think um, I mean, in John Burko and Lindsay Hoyle, who the two, well, uh, Lindsay had, um, we well, just taken over speaker just before I left uh, Parliament, but obviously he was Deputy Speaker. Um, I think you've got two examples of two very different styles, which I think is, is, is good. And I, I get the impression that every speaker stamped their own personal style on Parliament. The speaker is extraordinarily powerful. Um, in terms of who they call, not, not so much, well, I suppose it is in questions because obviously there'll be a list of people who are going to ask questions about the supplementaries. Um, in my experience, the speakers do try to be as uh, fair as possible in terms of balancing the MPs they call, experience, uh, where, they, where they represent, uh, the roles they do, experiences, and, and all the rest of it. They won't always get it right. Um, Lindsay has gone back, I think, to uh, not calling everybody. Um, in a statement, whereas John used to make statements go on for quite a long time. Um, and I think Lindsay was elected and there was a real, when they all stood for election after John Burke stood down, they all pledged to do things quite differently. So I think there was a feeling that actually the speaker had inserted himself too much into, um, uh, into parliament. But, but then it would be, we lived through an extraordinary period from 2016 to, to 2019. Uh, so, um, uh, you know, it's, I think it is a very important role and they take very seriously. The challenge of the speaker actually is not so much in the chamber, which of course is the bit that we all see, mm. it's how they run the House of Commons um, in terms of uh, HR practices and the culture created and everything mm. else. And we know that is a much bigger, uh, and I think almost it's a tougher nut to crack than managing uh, members of parliament in front of the TV cameras. I think just pick up on that uh, uh, that final point. I think speakers have uh, three roles, and there's a kind of fourth, slightly uh, minor role, but three roles. So, so firstly, there's the procedural role, which is uh, which is the visible role that we all, that we see the speaker in the house uh, keeping. Uh, keeping order, um, uh, calling members, and uh, and dealing with uh, procedural issues, interpreting pr uh, procedure on the on the floor of the house. Um, uh, then there's the governance role, um, 
which is just referred to. And this is a really important role, but uh, we don't really see that much of it uh, in terms of the Speaker uh, chairs the House of Commons uh, Commission. And so uh, has a, a really important responsibility in the way that the House of Commons is actually uh, organised and managed. And the, uh, this, you know, this is a, a huge village there that uh, and the Speaker has an important role there. Um, and there's a third role, which is the ex external face. So when we look at the, think about the, the, the House of Commons, often it could be an educational face as well, visiting schools and so on, explaining the, yeah. um, um, the, the, the role of Parliament more, more, more widely. Uh, now there is a, there's a fourth role, which the Speaker also has a constituency as well that has some responsibility for. But I think the three key roles around procedure, governance and that external face make the Speaker a really uh, important player uh, in the Commons but it is all about relations as well so the speaker may have a very large office and so on and uh, and maybe an important traditional uh, role but they have to build relations between uh, across parties but also with with minor parties as well uh, has to st have to stand up for backbenchers rights speaking rights uh, but also has to make sure that the, the, the House of Commons is is governed correctly uh, as well as a credible institution too and so we've seen recently over the debate over uh, <coughs> over um, voting uh, and um, the return to the normalising parliament as much that we've had this uh, we've had this um, balancing act between what the speaker thinks is safe and correct uh, within the Commons and the leader of the House wishing to uh, uh, to move move away from a hybrid parliament. Uh, so the speaker has that responsibility for safety of members staff in the house as well um, but ultimately it's uh, it's a, it's a balancing act with the leader of the house um, and i noticed one of the questions we had was about what, what what's happened to the house business committee um, so there's no sense that uh, you have a multi-party committee in the uh, in the house uh, that can uh, advise on matters of governance perhaps and arrangements in the house it's left to this uh, the, the leader of the house and the speaker trying to work out what might be best for the house thank you um slightly different tack just scrolling through some more of the questions and thank you very much everybody they're they're, they're coming in in their in their numbers um baroness morgan there's a there's a question here that just struck me as as an interesting one to hear about from from your sort of personal experiences and perspectives about balancing portfolio commitments with constituency business mm. and and how do you enable which sort of feeds into that whole you know how do you get the right priority to get the things that need to be put forward put forward and how much of attention have you found that um, attention to any jobs i've done in the sense that i've had to make a decision as a minister which i know is um uh opposed or, or detrimental to the constituency i suppose the, the obvious one would be uh, you know, being transport secretary and also representing a constituency under the flight path of Heathrow, for example, that we know that there are people, you know, that's, that is, that's obviously a, a, a challenge. Um, but I think I always found it amusing that people, um, uh, often in the press, object to MPs having second jobs. And the ultimate second job you can have is to be a minister, because frankly, uh, particularly depending on the department you're in, what's going on at the time, I'm sure the ministers would say this at the current situation, you, you are so busy being a minister uh, that actually um, trying to juggle that with being a constituency MP, um, it is possible. And I think it's very important actually that we do have, um, including the prime minister, somebody who should be you know, doing constituency surgeries as well. And I remember talking to David Cameron about this and said, how do you go from uh, you know, uh, worrying about international affairs to thinking about what's going on in the constituency. He said, well, I, I like thinking about the potholes in, you know, Whitney, because uh, it reminds me of who elected me to be here and what they what they care about. And I think that is very levelling for, for you know, ministers and, and prime ministers. Um, but you have to often, as you get promoted, you get a bigger job, you have to have uh, the right staff around you who can obviously help to deal with a lot of constituency uh, queries. Um, I think I was very unusual in terms of I handled my inbox myself uh, as a constituency MP. So I wanted to see what people locally were sending to me about things they cared about. Uh, I wanted help with, even though obviously I would then ask members of staff to actually do a lot of the day-to-day uh, the, the -day and the detailed uh, work. And I signed all my letters myself. 
again so I knew what people were people were saying thank you um another theme that I've picked up if we can um continue to ask our two excellent speakers to 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 answer some of these questions um I just think we'd, we'd quite like your thoughts um on what you see as the kind of biggest threats to scrutiny and to um, holding government to account, if you like. And I'm asking that question because of the various debates that are going on in the chat box around how do we hold um, people like specialist advisors to account? Um, how do we actually manage the kind of situations that we've seen recently where specialist advisors have, have done things that were really quite unusual in our normal processes. So sort of a, 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 a general question and then something a little bit more specific there. So, so, so what, what in your view from your experiences is, is the biggest threat that we, we face in terms of our parliamentary system for scrutiny? And, 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 and is there anything there that we should be, you know, how do we, how do we manage this growth of specialist advisors and the idea that they are there um, unelected and, and, and playing quite a powerful, important role in, in, in informing and influencing? I mean, there's a number of different sides to that uh, question. Just to, talking about uh, special advisors. I mean, special advisors are absolutely uh, critical in making the whole thing work. Um, uh, they're not the only parts of it. Uh, and what you want are people who are able, particularly, you only really get a special advisor if you're Secretary of State or obviously in, in, in Downing Street. Um, and when you, as a minister, can't be in the department, they are vital in terms of being eyes and ears and making things happen and making the machine work and some are more effective at that obviously than uh, than others um, I mean it's very clear in the ministerial code that ultimately it's the minister um, who is responsible for their behavior um, and uh, you know as a, as a minister employing special advisors you have to remind occasionally remind them of that or be reminded of it uh, your uh, yourself um, and I think you know in terms of I was thinking about you know feeding into what, what affects the trust I mean um, I think the coverage of politics um, and it's, it's perhaps, you know, it's always everyone always moans about, you know, um, what's being said about them and all the rest of it. But I think there is there is an obsession sometimes now with personalities as opposed to issues. Um, I wouldn't believe that all special advisors are nearly as powerful as people like make them out to be. But they are often the people who the journalists are speaking to, not the ministers. And therefore, they get sort of made more important in terms of the whole uh, system. Um, uh, but you know, but clearly they are. They have to be uh, accountable, explain their their behaviours. But it is ultimately it's the minister who is responsible very much for uh, for what they do. I think the biggest threat to democracy. I mean, it's very interesting that the, the whole issue about virtual proceedings is is like so many other sectors. We have leapt forward in you know ten weeks that we thought about doing for ten years probably. Um, I still think there's a role, there has to be a role, that, that, you know, uh, for people going back to, to Westminster. I think it's very important. I think it's face-to-face -face contacts are very important. That's how it, it all works. Um, I think the biggest uh, threat, though, is um, it is about the culture of Westminster, it's the behaviour of, of MPs, elected officials and, and peers as well, in terms of undermining uh, people's uh, trust. I think if you ask most people, they would say that their own MP is doing a, a good job, particularly if they've had dealings with them or, or a friend or, or colleague or family has, but often there is a view that the whole of politics uh, mm. is not serving the, the country well. And I think if that continues, um, however, I also think that uh, we have always loved to hate our politicians. And I always tell the story when I go and speak at schools about the fact that when the House of Commons burnt down in the mid uh, 19th century, the good people of London stood on the opposite bank of the Thames and cheered. So, um, you know, we shouldn't kid ourselves that people have always loved uh, those in, in, in Westminster. But we can all do, you know, much, as much as we can to make sure that, that people's trust in us is, is well placed. Thank you. Uh, that's, I mean, that's a big question in what our, what our biggest sort of threats are to uh, parliamentary democracy at, at the moment. I think let's, let's deal first with maybe uh, special advisors. So we've seen a growth in special advisors. Um, um, Prime Ministers uh, have appointed more special advisors, time's, time's gone on, there may be various uh, reasons for that, so back to uh, Tony Blair's day, you know, you, you'd have a lot of attention around personalities there, your uh, Alistair Campbell in particular and others, who, and uh, a lot of attention over the, the, the power of those, those special advisors through to Dominic Cummins uh, now. I think there's a very strong case for special advisors uh, to uh, be more accountable uh, and to um, be scrutinised potentially by, by select committees. We have an individual 
uh, who's a senior policy advisor at the moment for the Prime Minister, uh, who had who has uh, refused pre previously to appear before select committee, and that's rather worrying for the select committee system. Um, and I think there is a strong case for special advisors uh, to um, explain their actions in front of select committees, um, particularly uh, when we're seeing uh, uh, it's, it's more over issues than than, uh, than personalities and individuals, uh, particularly as you see that uh, uh, that um, uh, special advisors may be involved in developing policy. Um, we'd like to know, particularly those liaison committee sessions I referred to, said, well, who was involved in developing this policy? Uh, and we'd like, you know, it's, it's important for the functioning of democracy to get an idea of where, I did, where uh, certain ideas and policy, uh, po um, policy may have come from. Um, I think um, the other perhaps issue which is really important in terms of uh, perhaps uh, trust in, in, in Parliament as an institution is something that I, I mentioned in my, in my talk is about how uh, government and the executive uh, dominates uh, time and dominates um, um, Parliament. So um, for instance, the, we've had the Intelligence and Security uh, Committee is not set up yet, it's not functioning yet, uh, it requires government to uh, to set that up. Liaison committee uh, took an incredibly long time to be set up and it was dependent on government to set that up. So uh, I would be in favour to help build trust in parliament but also uh, the, the institution as a whole that parliament had more control over time or over its ability to set up uh, committees uh, and uh, and so therefore in, in governance issues had more control without having to uh, get agreement from uh, or be led by by uh, by the government of the day so we may have for instance the restoration and renewal program uh, has now sort of um, been run into the sand um, <coughs> parliament um, the building itself needs to be rebuilt uh, needs to be restored uh, but parliament can't agree and that's largely because of many of the governance issues that are there between between government uh, between government between uh, MPs but also the governance systems there and the House Business Committee would help um, but the ability for Parliament to manage its own affairs I think would really help to build trust as well and to help the that accountability and scrutiny function uh, too. Thank you. Um, I'm conscious of, of time I've got a couple more questions that I'm lining up if my speakers are still willing and able to, to continue with this that would be great um, I'm going to leave the more general question just to, to, to a minute there's, there's a more detailed question that's just come through from someone about going back to this effectiveness of PMQs Prime mm -hmm. Minister questions um, do you feel at the moment that the um, current effectiveness of PMQs is down to the social distancing and the changing format of them or is it more down to Keir Starmer's style in contrast to Corbyn's? I mean, I personally would say it's the latter. I think it's 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 a very uh, it's a very different opposition uh, leader without wishing to be in any way uh, political. And I think it's a style of questioning at PMQs we haven't seen probably since I'd have said you know Ed Miliband and David Cameron, who were fairly evenly matched at, at not always but but most times and it was a it was a more effective thing um i, I don't i think the the, the fewer people show that the house of commons is a, is a funny old beast and and actually um you know you need sometimes you can sense sense a mood in the house uh, with lots of people there and you can see whether a prime minister or a minister has done enough to keep the house on both sides uh you know answered the question or or, or, or reassured um and I don't think it's possible to do that at the moment. But I, so I think it is down to the, the question, the effectiveness of the questioning for the opposition. I think leaders of the opposition have a really challenging time in that uh, it's, um, it's only really a prime minister's questions that they can gain that uh, uh, can demonstrate that they are a sort of a leader in waiting or they have to demonstrate to their own side as well um, that they are uh, um, that they are a competent leader that uh, they're in charge of their brief so um, that's that one opportunity uh, that, that, that they have to potentially land some blows but also to tease out and policy I think um, uh, at the moment we've got it's it's 
we're in a very strange uh, situation in that, that we have the sort of questioning and sort of exchanges that, that, that many people have criticised Prime Minister's question and said, well, these are the sorts of exchanges we should be having. Now, that's partly to do with a different type of questioning from, uh, from the leader of the opposition, but also it's due to these extremely unusual circumstances uh, where you know, there's, there's, there's less noise, it's not a full chamber and so on, and uh, we've probably got a lot of uh, emphasis on, this, uh, on, on these exchanges as well. They're, they're all about uh, uh, the pandemic and the government's response as well. So uh, very unusual circumstances, uh, but I think it's a combination of those circumstances, but also a, a slightly different style of questioning as well. But then every leader of the opposition wants to have a sort of different style of questioning to try and you know, wrong foot the prime minister. Thank you. So I think um, a sort of another question that came in a while back, which I think is probably going to be our, our last question um, for this session. Um, it's a more general question, again, to both of you, please. If you could reform one aspect or one, one element of the scrutiny process, what would it be and why? Mm. Go on. Okay, I'll go for it. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. That's a tough one. That's a uh, one <laughs> um, I think... Um, I, bearing in mind that I've, I've conducted uh, a lot of research on liaison committee, um, I, would, uh, I would have much more regular sessions um, and, uh, and it, not leave it to the discretion of the Prime Minister whether they attend or not. Because I think, referring back to our last question about uh, sort of those uh, type of exchanges with the Prime Minister, I think there's a potential for the liaison committee evidence sessions for the Prime Minister, if they're more regular, uh, to, uh, to uh, be that sort of forensic um, uh, scrutiny of, of, um, of uh, policy uh, that could really benefit the House of Commons as a whole. At the moment, they're rather infrequent, um, but I think that the, the, if we, if those sessions were much more regular, uh, then uh, we could see a sort of a different type of, of dynamic to scrutinize, uh, uh, scrutiny of the Prime Minister. No, I think that's, that's right. I mean, I, when I was on Liaison Committee, we also talked about whether other ministers should come for Liaison Committee, particularly the Chancellor, actually. Um, I, I think um, the, the bit for me that so it doesn't work, I think has changed dramatically is the scrutiny of legislation and the detail in which that's that's done. And that's fascinating seeing the difference between the House of Commons and the House of Lords. In the House of Lords, there's, I think there's more time, but of course there's often more expertise and they take the revising chamber responsibility very seriously. I think in the Commons, just because the, the role of being an MP has changed so much to being much more of a, of a constituency champion and everything else, I think many of the older, long-serving MPs feel that actually the, uh, the role of really scrutinising legislation and making it better has, has diminished. Um, and, um, and I think really, you know, um, if you're a government whip, you want the legislation to go through as quickly as possible with as few amendments as possible. Um, and I understand that from a delivery of business point of view, but, but I, I think that that's probably something that's when, you know, poorly drafted legislation gets through and then we rue the day and have to change it in a few years time. Thank you. Um, I think that's probably all we've got time for in terms of questions and thank you very very much to both our speakers. Just before we go I'm going to hand us back to David. Yes thanks Rose and yeah thank you to both Nikki and Mark for such fascinating talks and for giving such candid answers to the really penetrating questions. Um, so I hope everyone you've got lots to pass on to your students. As you know this is the first online seminar we've done with uh, alongside the Political Studies Association. We'd like to do more of them so why don't you set the agenda? Uh, if you fill in the feedback form you'll be able to suggest topics for future events and also, you know, convenient times for you. Um, and uh, a recording, as we said, of today's session will be available along with Mark's slides. And um, don't forget Parliament Week begins on the 1st of November. Um, if you sign your school up for Parliament Week, 
uh, you will get a free resource kit. Okay, so what more? Better motivation can you have? <laughs> so once again, thanks to Nikki and Mark, and goodbye to you all, and hope to see you again soon. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.